That falls on on the different ground. How many of you can remember the different grounds it falls on? Yes? Oh, I thought you lit your hand up. Yes. Some one fell on a good ground. Okay. One fell ground eating stony ground. One is good ground, one is stony ground. One see devil came to get away on the turns, okay. Which that one again? Okay. So there are four different grounds, right? Most times, many of us may not really understand what this is, but let us relate this as your own heart. Don't think about somebody else. Think about you. So that we think about somebody else and forget us. Is your heart stony ground? Is it full of thorns? Or is it a good ground? Is your heart the kind of heart that when the seed is sown, the devil comes and takes it away right away? Or is your heart the kind of heart that when the seed is sown, it really is being prepared to receive it? Or is your heart the type that you have uh, thorns, which is the cares of this world? You're so worried about the bills, the children, the everything that the world have no place to, to take root. You know, what kind of heart do you have? Which heart do you have? I know we all know the answer to that. What did we learn last week? Did the word take root or, or some stuff, the devil took it out after you left church? Or too much of worries? I many of you remember what we studied last week? Without referring to your book. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Repentance, okay. See, last week, see, don't forget that. That's close to that. We've been talking about the book of Matthew, we're in chapter 4, right? So it's very easy. Chapter 4, and last week we, we, we stopped at uh, verse, what verse we stopped last week? Verse what? 14? Can be 14. 17, yes. Verse 17. So if I were you, the, the Bible says that the, 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 the Berean, B-E-R-A-N, Christians, they search the scripture to find that if what they have been taught is the truth. So after you learn the word of God, you go back home. When I was sitting on this side of the pew, believe me, when the pastor teach the word, when I go home that night, I would dig into that word again. If I won't even go to bed, I would read it, I would check my note, I would make sure I understand it completely. Is it? And most time we go home after service, we we'll go order pizza, and then we even forget what we thought. <laughs> you know. So really, the good thing is this: after we study the word of God, when you go home, study it again. The good part about systematic study of the word of God, like we're doing right now, it gives you a chance to know what we're studying next week. So you know exactly next week we're going to study from this verse. And most likely to this verse. So you read it, you try to dissect it, uh, so that when the pastor is teaching, you know, you have a better idea because you've actually read the scripture ahead of time. Amen? Even when you come to church next Wednesday, you would have already read it on that. You just come in, just read it for like a couple of minutes to refresh your mind so that when I start teaching, it comes right in. Because what happens is that if our heart is not prepared for the word, you can hear the word and the devil comes in and take it out because the ground has not been prepared. So how do you prepare your heart to receive the word of God? You prepare your heart to receive God's word. One, prayer. Everyone say prayer. Two, meditation. Everyone say meditation. And three, obedience. Everyone say obedience. So you prepare your heart by prayer, God, I prepare my heart tonight as I'm about to hear your word. Let it, let it, you know, penetrate my heart. Let your word change me. Let me not go back the same way. 
So your heart is prepared. You are preparing your heart. And then you begin to meditate on the word of God. And also you obey what you've read. When you do that, your heart is always prepared to receive from God. But when you don't do that, it's very easy for the things of this life to come in and choke it. You know what it means to choke? I don't know if you have weeds in their lawn, garden, yes. Leaves, weeds in their garden. I don't know if you have gardens to begin with. <laughs> I don't know if you have garden. Just you? Just one person have garden. I don't know if you have weeds in your garden. You see, so you can see you have. God bless you, brother. God bless you. Come on, come, come up front. Come up front, please. Come up front. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Come up front. You can just sit on the second row, first row. That's fine. That's fine too. That's fine. That's fine. God bless you. I understand. I would do exactly the same thing you just did. I'm not sitting in the front <laughs> first time. <laughs> I'll do the same thing, but that's fine. You are, you are welcome. God bless you. Thanks for coming in to study God's word with us. Okay. So when you have weeds in your garden, it chokes the flowers. And some of us have flowers and we have, um, we plant some tomatoes. And because of the weeds, you hardly even see the tomatoes. The weeds have even had grown the tomatoes. So what are those weeds? They are basically the worries of life when you are so worried about everything. So God's word that's supposed to take root in your life doesn't have the chance to pick up and begin to grow. If God's word does not grow in your life, God's word will not work for you. There are many of us in this house that quote the Bible and it don't work for you. You know why? Because it has nothing to work on. It's, it's not there. The word of God in your head will not transform your life. Say it with me. The word of God in my head will not transform my life. It, it will just be a head knowledge. You will just know it in your head, but your life is not changed. But God's word in your heart is able to transform your life. God's word in your heart can transform your life completely. I don't know about you, but it does that to me and to others that I know. When you have God's word in your heart. How does God's word get in your heart? It's really by meditating on the word of God. Looking at the word of God. The Bible says that faith cometh by, by what? And hearing by what? The word of God. So if you can never have faith without letting that word that you've heard get into your spirit. Until the word of God you are hearing becomes a rhema it will not produce fruit in your life. The Bible says the sower sows the seed. Every word I speak out of my mouth right now is a seed. Say with me, words are seeds. So it's a seed. And don't forget this. The Bible says this too. Some bring 30, some bring up 50, and some what? 100. Why? It depends on the nature of your heart. So, you pray, oh God, I'm praying for this thing, Lord. Let it work for me right now. If, if, it's, if the word you've received had not taken fruit, root in your heart, it cannot bring hundred. So the word of God would not produce for you if it has not really have, if it's not deeply seated in your heart. Why am I saying all of this? This is important because we come to Bible studies, awesome, great, and I'm glad that we do that. But I want you to come in here in anticipation to receive that word. Your heart prepared to receive it, not just to have a head knowledge. If, if it is just a head knowledge, guess what? You can read it at home and just know it in your head and that's it. It is more than a head knowledge. We are not about, we are not just teaching you the Bible for you just to know it in your head, 
to say, no, I know the Bible. Guess what? I know the Bible. No, it is the Bible producing fruit. The Bible says also, by their fruit, you will know them. Which fruit? It's not the apples or bananas. And most times, it's not even by the way, most times we think is by, it's by how we live. And that is part of it. But it's by the fruit, the, what the word produces in your life, that you know the word is in your life. Because if the word is not producing, guess what? It's not there. Because the word is meant to produce. Everyone said the word must produce. Because God is in the business of making profit. I'll say it again. God is not a failing God. It's in the business of making profit. He does not give his word for you to fail. That's why he says in his word, every word that proceeded out of my mouth shall not return to me void without accomplishing the purpose of which that word has been sent. So when the word is sent, it ought to produce if your heart receives it. Amen? If I say right now, you are blessed. Someone say, Amen. So I receive it. I don't know about you, but I remember as a young man, even now, I can hear the pastor preaching and he says a word. I receive it with my heart. Because when you receive it, it begins to manifest. You see? But if you just casually think it's just talking, then nothing gets in. Because words are spirit. If you receive if you, if you are alert and sensitive to the Spirit of God and the word comes out and you catch it. Everyone say you catch it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you have ever caught it one time when I'm talking here. You just catch it and you know you got it. And no one can take it away from you. No one can negotiate you away from that word because you've got it. Amen? How do you get it? You get it by really opening your heart to really catch it. Like you... You stayed glued. I remember many months ago, uh, I mean, many of you, but I know Sister Mara does that, and many of you do the same thing, but many months ago with Brother Jason, when he first gave his life to Christ, you know, he, when he sits on that chair at the hotel, my goodness, it's like his eyes wants to knock me down. He does not blink. I say, my, does this brother blink at all? He's all like this. Like every, it's like he's ready to grab everything I'm saying. You know, and, I'm not, and he always sat in the front then. But when he does that, it makes, it pulls something out of me because I see somebody who is ready to receive. Like when Jesus said, virtue has left me because the lady pulled it out of him. Not that, not just because it touched her or him because of her heart condition ready to receive. There are many others that have touched Christ but pulled nothing. But this lady came in with an intention to receive. Amen? I don't know if you came into Bible studies to receive. Or you just came so they can say you came. I don't know if you have been there before. Let me just come so that they will say I came to church. I don't want to get a call from the pastor again asking me what happened. <laughs> you know, but we all have been, I have been there too, so what I'm saying is because I know it, I have been there. So I'm not saying this, trying to put you down, we all have been there. There are times in my life when I was not a pastor, I said, my God, the pastor, if I don't show up today, he will be calling me, let me just come and just sit there, but I can't wait for church to be over because I got to go home. I'm hungry. We have been there. But when I do that, guess what I don't receive? Because you know, I cannot teach you what I don't know. So when I say something, because I have been there, I know it. And when people lie, I know they're lying. Because guess what? I have been in that part before. Why are you late? Man, there was heavy traffic. You can't believe it. No, no traffic. You just left home late. Just tell the truth. You left home late. No traffic. Pastor, you wouldn't believe it. There was traffic on 78. I had to go round and round and round. You know. So, but, but what am I saying about this? That you need to have the heart to receive. And I thank God for every one of you because your heart tonight is to receive. Amen? So today we are continuing from our Bible studies. We are still in the book of Matthew. 
And like, like you know, we are not going to rush this. We will take our time to study the Bible verse by verse, explain what it means, break it down, and see how it applies to us today. Last week we stopped in verse 17. And today we're going to read verse 18. Matthew chapter 4. And if you want a title for this, I'm not sure if your Bible has any subheadings. It will be like fishers of men. I'm not sure if your Bible has a subheading. Does the Bible have a subheading? What does it say? Of oh, forward. Okay, four fishermen caught as disciples. Okay. Mine doesn't have any heading. But let's read from verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea for they were fishers 19 and he said unto them follow me and I will make you fishers of men and they straight away left their nets and followed him 21 and going on from there he saw another two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending, fixing, repairing their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. We'll stop there. We started by saying last week, or for the past few weeks, that the book of Matthew is presenting Jesus Christ as a king. The king is coming. And we, we also learned weeks ago about John the Baptist as a forerunner, announcing the arrival of this king that is coming. We also talked about Jesus beginning his ministry. We talked about that last week. We talked about the point. We talked about the place. And today we're going to deal a little bit about the partners. Everyone say the point, the place, the proclamation, and the partner. Now we're talking about the point. The point basically referring to at the point where Jesus started. We talked about John the Baptist put in jail. And Jesus started. Jesus waited at the right time. And last week we were able to establish that in this world that there is time and purpose for everything that happens. Nothing happens in your life that has not already been planned by God. Nothing is catching God by accident. God knows everything about you. He knows you. He knows you from inside out. He knows your plans. He knows what you want to do. He knows your life. So whatever happens in your life as a child of God who is living according to the word of God, don't you stress out. Don't you worry. Just know that your father is in control. He is still on the throne. And you don't worry. You just believe that the God who have started a thing in you will bring it to completion at the right time. So you don't stress out. Amen? So that is about the point. That we talked about the place. When we mention the place, we refer to the place called Galilee. Galilee at that time is, not, is, is a city. It's like the hub. The hub of that area where things are happening. It's not like Jerusalem. It's a place where you have a lot of people residing. It's a place at the time, estimation of millions of people that live in that place called Galilee. Jesus Christ went to start his ministry in a liberal place, liberal center. He did not go to, to uh, Jerusalem to start. He did not even start in Nazareth. He went to a place called Galilee. Everyone say a place. 
That means in your life, there is a place where you flourish. You cannot flourish in every place. If you are in a place and you are not flourishing, guess what? You are in the wrong place. I will say it again. If you are in a place in your life and you are not flourishing, watch out. You might have been in the wrong place. Amen? Amen. Because it's the purpose and plan of God that you flourish. And when I mean flourish, what does that mean? Some of you think flourish means that you have $10,000. Flourish basically means in your spiritual life. Let's look at, at the angle of God, not at the angle of man. God wants you to flourish spiritually from inside out. If there is dryness in your life, if there is no, no, the one who serve God in your life. That means you are basically in the wrong place. Because the purpose and plan of God for every child of his is to serve him. So we have the right, we have the right point and we also have the right place. So Jesus Christ knew the right place for him to start was right in where? Galilee. Everyone say Galilee. Galilee. When God sent me, us to this town, to Allentown, to Lehigh Valley, we knew we had to be in the right place. We have other opportunities to start this church in Bethlehem. It was easier to get a place in Bethlehem or the Eastern, much easier than getting a place in this area. But I knew somehow in my spirit that God wanted us to be in a place in Allentown, in a more central area. Why? You know, obviously you would know why in the future. I will tell you why as time goes on. But you have to be in the right place. When you are in the right place in your life, you begin to see some results. You begin to see things happening in your life. When you are in the wrong place, things begin to happen in the wrong way. When, you, when things are going bad in your life, you have to find out what has just happened. Did you change location? Did you change friends? Something must have been introduced into your life to produce the result that you are currently receiving in your life. Everyone say right point, right place. Then we talked about the right proclamation. Jesus Christ has to proclaim something. What was the right proclamation? The right proclamation, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So we see Jesus preaching the same message that John the Baptist was preaching for years. John the Baptist was this wild man who lived in the wild. He only ate certain kind of food. He ate bugs and wild honey. You know what wild honey is? I don't know if you have ever eaten honey. I don't know if you have ever seen honey, how it's formed. Wow, some of you, that's great. That's great. You know, white honey is the honey that is formed under the rock. Under the rock. The ones I've seen are the ones formed by a tree. And you see it's dripping. I don't know if you have seen honey dripping. Did you ever put your mouth to test it? You scared the, the, the bee might get you, right? So you, so you have the honey, but so he ate only white honey and low cost bugs basically bugs so he's and so he have been proclaiming repent 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 for god's kingdom is at hand and last week we dealt with repentance in in detail we spoke last week that repentance is not a true repentance if it does not change your life 360 degrees repentance is not just change your thinking it is part of it, but it's changed your life. You cannot say I've repented and sit through into some old stuff. To truly repent means that you really turn around your life. You have repentance and you also have conversion. Repentance is the act of a will. Conversion is the act of God. Repentance is what you decide. You know what? I'm going to repent. I'm tired of living like this. God help me. Conversion, God with his own gracious, how with his grace saves us. Not because of what you can do, but because of what Christ has done. So you are converted. You are, you are converted. You are born again. See, you, are, you, you repent because you are converted. You are not converted because you have repented. I will say it again. You repent because you have converted. You, you don't 
convert because you repent. Did you all get that? You are born again, not because you've repented. You repent because you are born again. Everyone say, I repent because I'm born again. Say, I repent because I am born again. So what that does is that that takes away you thinking it's because of what you've done that that's why you are saved. Because you have no hand to play in your salvation. You cannot save yourself. What you do don't save you. What you do don't save you. What you don't do don't save you. But what you do is a proof that you have been saved. You do get that? You do get that? What you do don't save you. If you don't smoke, it don't save you. If you don't curse, it don't save you. If you don't steal, it don't save you. If you don't do the bad stuff a lot of people do with pleasure, that don't save you. Because I have met a lot of people in my life who don't do all those stuff, but they're not saved. But when you are saved, you don't do that. Amen? The Bible says in that, 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 the Bible says that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. Is that in the Bible? That the goodness of God, the grace of God is what leads us to repent. Because God is so good, now you want to repent. You are not repenting so you can enjoy God. No, you are repenting because God has been so good to you. Did you catch that? So, so anytime you feel, you feel so pompous because you are doing something good, you better remember what you do is not what saves you, it's what Christ has done. That is the difference between religion and Christianity. It is in the way they are spelled. Religion and Christianity is different based on the way they are spelled. Religion is spelled do. Christianity is spelled done. Amen? So as a Christian, you are a Christian because of what Christ has done done. You are religious because of what you do. And many people are religious. They just do, do, do. Your doing don't save you. It's what Christ has done that saves you. When you put your faith in what Christ has done, that is what saves you. Amen? But then when you are saved, you can no more do the same things you have been doing because now you saved. How can you be saved and be doing that? And that was so frustrating to Apostle Paul. He said, how can you guys be saved and living like this? How can you be so carnal? That's why there are different kinds of Christians. You have the carnal Christians. There are many of them in America. They're very carnal. And then you have Christians who are spiritual. And they are Christians. But they are just, some are just kind of just, just moved by the flesh. They fight, they curse, they quarry, they keep anger, they bite, bite, they all kind of stuff. Gossip. But the Christians, Paul was frustrated because he, he sees some of these brothers sleeping with their, with, their, with their husbands, with their fathers, wives, and just all kind of nonsense. Brothers in church messing around with each other. Just nonsense was going on. And Paul said in the book of Galatians, who bewitched you, O oh Galatians? Who bewitched you? What's wrong with you guys? Saved people don't do this stuff. If you are saved, you're not supposed to do this. Saved people don't act like this. Everyone say, I'm saved. I'm saved. Therefore, Therefore, I am changed. I am say it again, I'm saved. I'm saved. Therefore, Therefore, I am changed. Amen. So it is the salvation that makes you want to do what God wants to do. The Bible says the proof of love for God is that you do what he commands you to do. You are truly my disciples if you obey my word. Amen. If you don't obey my word, you are not my disciple. So we talked about the right point, the right place, the right proclamation, and today, the right partners. That was the right partners. See, Jesus knew he's stepping into a ministry. He needs to choose some partners. He needs to um, pick some people because he knows this ministry is getting into cannot be done without all the people. He needs to choose men and women that would carry out the work. 
So here comes Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee. And he saw Simon, who is also known as Peter. And he said, Simon, Peter, follow me. You know what Simon Peter did? He called his brother. What's his brother's name? Huh? Andrew. So two, two brothers. That's why Christianity is about families. Relationship among families. That's why I love this church. Because we are all families here. We all together. If I just start naming right now, you have this one, family to this one, and this one, family to that one, and that one, family to that, just all interwoven. Everybody is connected. And that is the way it ought to be. It's families. That is that bond of relationship that keeps us together. So here we see Peter now with his brother. Will Peter feel comfortable with his brother in that place? Of course, yes. Because now Peter is no more by himself. His brother is with him. Now, he goes to the next one. He meets the man by the name of James. And James has a brother. What's his brother's name? Huh? Brother's name? It's, I can't hear you. John. Is it John? Read your Bible. Read verse 18. Two brothers. Read verse 19. The sons of Zebedee. What's his name? What's his name? John. Okay. Everyone say John. John. So you have James. And James is a brother to who? John. So guess what? You have two brothers from the same family following Christ. So it becomes a whole lot easier. Like we have Sister Quanisha and I believe brother, uh, brother, uh, your husband, Mr. Russell, invited her husband then her husband probably invited you, and then you invited your mother, and your mother invited a sister, and the sister invited a sister, and the... it's like that. And you invited some Monica. Where, where's Monica? She's on the way. <laughs> that is that is the way it is. It's about families. Everyone say families and relationship. That is what keeps us together. That is what that is a bond that keeps us together. Or like Sister Myra inviting Sister uh, Tracy. And the list goes on. Or Telisha bringing a friend. Or Mr. Uh, your dad, Mr. Camfield, bringing Brother Haywood. And Brother Haywood bringing the, sis, the daughter. Like that. Like that. So, but this is, this is the model that Christ started. It's about families and friends working together, being partners with Christ. Amen? Are you getting something with this? Now, let's go back to our, our, our scriptures and see what we find in there. Walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting net into the sea. They were fishers. <coughs> and now, this is important that I share this with you. Jesus Christ did not call the Pharisees and the learned of his days. There are men and women, in, mostly men in his days, who knew the Bible. The Bible as, is, as it is known then is basically the Old Testament. They knew the Torah. They understand the Torah, the five books of the Bible, the book of Moses. They knew it. But Jesus did not call those who know it so much. He called the common man, the common man, the fisherman, the man who is doing the everyday to the activity, probably smelling like fish, right? I don't know if you have ever hung around fishermen. I don't know if you have gone catching fish before. You have real one to eat, not just to play with. It's only in America as people catch fish and put it back in the water. Mike, when I catch fish in Nigeria, like, we catch that fish. That fish is going to be eaten. We don't throw it back in the water. You know, after I catch the fish, oh, fish, throw it banana. We don't do that. We go for fishing because we want to eat some food. 
I remember as a young man growing up, I used to go with my father fishing. I know I will talk about that you know, in a few minutes, but let me just share that very quickly. We would go fishing and we would go in the middle of the night. It was probably like the age of between the age of 10, maybe 14. Maybe, let me say between the age of 9 and 12. We would go, we would set the trap. We would set the trap for the fish. We would set it in different spots in the water. I'll be following my dad. We'll set this one here. We'll set it there. Then in the morning, around five, before anybody wakes up, we will go to see if our trap has caught any fish. And many times we have all these fish. And we're so excited. Man, we've caught some fish. Then we'll carry the fish to the, to the dry line and begin to clean the fish. But it gets slimy and we smell like fish. Because when you play with fish, you smell like fish. Amen? Everyone say, when you play with the fish, you smell like the fish. Because you smell like fish, don't make you a fish. Don't forget that because I'm going somewhere with that statement. Just because you smell, not because you go around the fish that Jesus has commanded you to go catch, and you smell like them, don't make you them. But we'll talk about that. We have time to talk about that. But Jesus Christ did not call the elite of his days. He did not call those who knows the Bible. He called these men who probably don't know the Bible. Men with terrible behaviors. Talk of Peter. My goodness. Peter is worse than some of us here. Full of anger. This guy may get mad. Just like that. You mess with him he brings out the knife and cut off your ears. You don't mess around. He is full of temper. Men like that. Peter. John. Men that are so coward. Even Christ spent three years with them. Yet they are so coward. Their master was in prison. My master was arrested. They all took off. Imagine, that's so disappointing. Me like being your pastor, I get into trouble. Everyone just takes off and leaves me alone. That's, I just can't just imagine how Jesus, will, how Jesus felt. But this happens. So these men, they are not all that. They are just like you and I who have various issues in, in our lives. So the issues you have in your life does not preclude you from being called by God. Are you getting this? So don't you ever look down on yourself because of some things that you are working on in your life. Because Peter had to deal with that. Even after they became apostles, they, these guys were just, they just something else. Peter would go to a place to preach. And he would start acting different. He goes to preach to the Jews, he acts different. Like more or less like pretending to be who he was not. Very sad. But we'll not, when we get to Peter, we will discuss that more. See, so these men were not perfect. These men have different issues. They them have hot temper. Some of them uh, they deserted Christ. Even some of them were so mad that when they went to a city and the city, the people would not receive them, they just called out the fire and wiped them off. That is how bad they were. They would not even stand anyone that would not agree with them. Also, they didn't care for children. Children came around Drive the kids away. Just said, no, no, just said, no. Suffer the kids to come to me. Disciples didn't care. They want the kids to go away. Disciples were not that, they were not that hospitable. You have these thousands of people that are been listening to Christ for, for hours and hours and hours. It was getting late. Disciples said, oh, Jesus, let's send them away right now because. We don't want to spend money feeding these folks. They have no heart. These guys were hungry. Just said, no, we can't do that. Let's feed them. He said, no, we can't feed them. Let's send them away. Because we don't want to get involved in, in, in taking care of all these people. See, these are disciples now. These are disciples. Are you getting this? These are men that have issues. So I'm bringing you this part to encourage you that no matter where you are, that you have been called by God, not because you are perfect. You are called by God because he loves you and he wants you to be 
use in his kingdom. Amen? So don't you ever look down on yourself because of your past. What Christ really needs from you is your availability and your response to the call. These men, the Bible says, when Jesus Christ said, follow me, Peter and his brother Andrew followed him. They left everything and followed him. Amen? They left their net and followed him. He went to, he went to uh, James and John. Follow me. They left their net and left their father and followed Christ. Now that is what Christ is looking for. Is the heart to follow him. He's not looking for a perfect one to use. He's looking for a willing heart, a submissive person, and the one who is willing to do what God wants them to do. Amen? Gives me an example of David. The Bible says David is, is a man after God's own heart. Eyes. Heart. He called David the apple of my eyes. Why? Is it because David is perfect? No, because David has a heart for God. He messed up, but he grieves in his heart. He knows he has failed God. He knows he has messed up. And he was quick to repent and to get right with God. Now, that is what we, God wants from us. That when you see yourself in a bad rap, is to get away from that right away and say, God, I am sorry. I repent. I want to do what is right. I will make it from my heart. Everyone say with me, God, sees my heart. See, that's important. Because David really repented with his heart. It's not just with his mouth. Many of us repent with our mouth. Oh God, please, I won't do it again. Believe me, Lord. Believe me, God. Mean it. But they are lying. They don't mean it. They can't wait to do it again. So they think, oh God, you know what? God, believe me, God. If I do it next time, just kill me. I won't do it again. <laughs> I won't do it again. In your heart, they feel, I know God's not going to kill me. But let me just say to him, maybe he wouldn't think I'm serious. He knows you already. He knows you. It is your heart that he looks at. He looks at a, a willing heart. He looks at a heart that is willing to follow him with everything they've got at that moment. That's why your Christian life is day by day, is moment by moment. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't think about the past. Think about taking one step at a time. That's why I love a songwriter. I believe the song goes like this. One day at a time. Sweet Jesus, that's all I'm asking from you. Give me the strength to do every day that I have to do. Yesterday is gone, sweet Jesus, and tomorrow may never be mine. So, give me the strength to do every day what I'm supposed to do. Get clap for me, please. Clap for me. I'll listen. So we have to do is daily work with God. Don't worry about next week. Just do for today. That is my motto. That is the way I live. And believe me, it has really helped me a long way. Especially in the area of joy. Everyone say joy. joy. To me, I believe if I'm happy today, that means I am not sad today. So I'm not worried about happiness of tomorrow. I'm worried about happiness of today. So I make sure I am happy today and joyous today. Once today is over, the next day I'm happy again. If you do that every day, you become a happy person. You get me? So don't worry about, man, will I be happy five years from now? Think about today. That's why Jesus Christ said that today has enough of his own troubles to deal with. Deal with today, and when you get to tomorrow, you will take it one day at a time, one step at a time. That is how you enjoy the Christian journey. When you look too far ahead in this Christian walk, you're going to be so frustrated because you're going to be thinking, my God, how am I going to, how will I possibly do that? How will I possibly start this ministry? How will I possibly do this task? I just can't see myself. I have this problem, that problem, that problem. I just can't start. Just deal with day by day. 
and God begins to help you as you take one step at a time. Amen? So Jesus called his partners and he called these four men and he told them, follow me. Everyone say, follow me. Now this is the thing. How much are you following Christ? I know that from the story of Andrew and Peter, John and James, we know that Jesus Christ called them twice. Because it's obvious that they went back fishing. And Jesus met them again and they said, we have toiled all night and did not catch any fish. So they went back fishing. But he called them the first time and he called them again. And the second time he called them, they left some profession go. He now called them again the third time into apostleship. So we have different levels of course in our life. God calls you to this point one. He calls you again. He calls you again. He keeps calling your name. Look at someone tell them Jesus is calling your name. Ask them, will you answer? It's important that we really ask ourselves these questions. These men, no, despite their, their shortcomings, despite the kind of life they have lived, they did follow Christ without any reservation. But that also tells me about Christ. That tells me that Christ, man, he is, he is something else. For you to just call you, you leave everything, man, you must have something going for you. To leave your job, leave your profession, and just follow Christ. Jesus is something. When I, the more I read that story, the more I say, wow, Jesus really is, is not a wimp. He commanded some respect in, his, in Galilee. He told this man, follow me. And these two brothers left their net and left their dad, left their family business. They had a family business, fishing line. This year, father is Zippity and Sons fishing company. It has to be because God said Zippity, the sons of Zippity. Zebedee and Sons Fishing Company. They left their family business to follow Jesus. That they have no clue what business is doing. Except they know there's something unique about him. Amen? So when Jesus calls you to leave anything, it is not because he does not know the value of what you are involved in, but because he has something better for you down the road. Something bigger and better for you when it comes to leave a place and come to the next place because he has something better for you some of you have left places you have been in the past some of you have even left some churches and come here it's because he has a reason for calling you he called you to live here to come to spirit temple not because where you were is all that bad but because there is something he has for you at this next place of call. So the Bible says he called this disciple. Now, there are five disciples, there are five disciples that Jesus called in the Bible. And seven others, he chose them. Five he called. He called five men. And he chose seven. Everyone say he called five. And show seven. I just want you just to know that. Now the five men he called, the first one is who? Peter. Andrew. James. And John. The fifth person he called is Matthew. In the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 9. That was where he called Matthew. The other seven we would go deep into that as we study the actually chosen. But these five men he called. So Jesus had to call partners into his ministry. And he has not stopped calling. 
He is still calling today. As a matter of fact, is calling your name. He's calling you. He's calling you into, into a next level of living. He's calling you into a next level of service. He's calling you into a next level of obedience. He's calling you into a next level of holiness. Oh, wow, did I just say that? Because holiness have levels. Everyone say holiness, holiness. have levels. So there are levels of righteous living. Righteous living has nothing to do with righteousness. Righteousness is what you receive based on what Christ has done. Righteous living is what you do because you are righteous. Just talk about that for a minute. Okay. Everyone say righteousness is a gift from God. Righteous living is what you do because you are righteous. Because you cannot say that you are righteous if you are not having a righteous living. Because righteous living is a proof that you are what? Righteous. And righteousness is imputed unto you by what Christ has done for you on the cross. You are made righteous. So you are righteous. You are no more a sinner. You are no more a poor sinner saved by grace. Say with me, I'm not a poor sinner. Saved by grace. I am a righteous saint of God. Yes, you got to believe that. Because it is when you believe you are the righteousness of God that you begin to live righteously. It's when you call yourself, I am just a poor sinner saved by grace. I'm just a poor sinner saved by grace. I'm just, you know, I'm just a sinner. Who told you you are just a sinner? You have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light of his dear son. You will be transferred. Everyone say transferred. From the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. So, so you are righteous and you live righteously because of what Christ has done for you. Amen? So now he tells them, follow me. That is the greatest call for every child of God is to follow Christ. The greatest call for you is to follow Christ. But there's something amazing in the scripture. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. There's a big clause in that. Everyone say, make. make. Say it one more time. Make. Say it again. Make. That's very important. That means he is taking responsibility of making you into who he wants you to be. Don't stress out yourself. He has promised to make you into be fishers of men. You get it that? So don't you think, how am I going to do it? See, statistics has given us that 95% of Christians have not won or led anybody to Christ. 95%. It's hard to believe, but 95% of Christians has don't even know how to lead somebody to Christ. They don't know. And that is very sad. And that's because they think they have to make themselves. No. Jesus Christ said, you just follow me. If you follow me, I will make you. The trouble is that many Christians are not following Christ. But they are following Christ. Christ will make them to be fishers of men. Everyone say, follow Christ. And he will make you fishers of men. But it's important to, to really dwell on that make. It's important to dwell on the make part of the scripture. Because it shows you who Christ is. He tells you the interest he has for your success. 
He tells you that he's standing by you to achieve and to accomplish what he wants you to do. He does not call you without equipping you. The Bible says, or we say, that God does not call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. Should I say it again? God does not call those who are qualified, but once he calls you, he qualifies you. So don't you ever think that you need to get some qualifications. It is not about degrees. It's not about having a Bible degree. Before I had biblical degrees to my name, I had been preaching in churches. Before I ever went to Bible school, I had already been doing ministry. I have been winning souls for Christ. I have been preaching in convention without even going to Bible school. So the Bible school and the ordination is really just more like preparing yourself to have an in-depth understanding of the word of God. Like I was sharing with my sister um, days ago. I said, sister, I said that I actually learned more as a Christian when I was going to church than I learned in the Bible school. When I was going to church as a young man, our pastor would teach the word of God. If I would go there with books, our 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 notebook gets filled up. We buy a new notebook. It gets filled up. That to me was a Bible school. Now what we are doing right now is a Bible school. You don't even get this in a Bible school. You don't. What we are doing now, if you really take this serious and you get your note, by the time we are done with Matthew, maybe in the next two months or three months, whatever it takes, you would have known Matthew so well that you would leave it and you would teach it. Then you've gone to Bible school for Matthew. Then you do Luke, you will know it. Then you do Mark, and you do John, and you go back to Genesis, and do all of that. Then you know the Bible without even stepping your leg in any Bible college. But you've just learned it because you have a pastor and willing to teach it. Amen? I learned last week that this week, today is what? Okay, this week, that many pastors don't know the Bible. Many pastors in America do not know the Bible. And believe me, this is the truth. I have been to many churches in this country. They don't know the Bible. That's why they don't teach the Bible. That's why they teach you self-help, what you already know, to help you to improve yourself. They teach you how to be happy. Teach you how to make more money. They teach you how to have a good marriage with your wife. They teach you how to avoid being depressed. They teach you how to think of something. How to, what else? No, no, how to pray, that is, that is Bible. They just teach you stuff. How to make more money, how not to be depressed, how to, to, to have influence, how to get more influence in your place of job, how to let your employer love you more, how to get a new contract, how to dress up for success. See, everybody wants to hear that because they, because they are living in this realm. If you ask them about the blood, no idea. Ask them about the second coming of Christ, they don't know it. Ask them about the millennial reign of Christ, about angels, they have no clue. About the anointing, they have no clue. About the blood of Christ, they have no clue. About the cross, they have no clue. About sanctification, they have no clue. That's why they love troubles. That's why you see them running out with people's wives and committing all kinds of troubles and messing up places. Because we are not taught the Bible. But we need to really get into the Bible. Because once you know the Bible, depression will go away. Once you know the Bible, you will succeed. Once you know the Bible, all you will live happily with your wife and husband. Once you know the Bible, you have a better relationship. But if I spend time teaching you how to, how to make sure your wife loves you. Number one, make him dinner. Number two, serve him coffee when she's on the bed. Number three, rub his head. Number four, make sure that you give him a kiss at least three times a day. Number five, make sure you call her at least five times a day. Six, make sure you don't forget her birthday. Seven, make sure you send her flowers every anniversary. See, that is what we hear today. Believe me. If you turn on your TV now, 
TBN or what are they call word. You just hear all those kind of self talk. How to help the self is about self. How to be a better me. How to improve my self image. How to raise up my self esteem. Well, those are the stuff here. And guess what? People like it because each ear, they want to hear what made them feel good. Amen? But Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Go get some fish. Because the, 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 the field is ripe, the harvest is ripe, and the laborers are few. So here we see Jesus telling his disciples, these four men that he called right in the book of Matthew, he told them that he would make them fishers of men. Everyone say fishers, fishers. of men. Let's see. Let's talk about some. Now, why did they call the fishers? Why did they call fishermen? There are some things you can learn about fishermen. There are things you can learn about fishermen. And let's talk about that because once you understand the quality of fishermen, that that would help you to know how to catch men for Christ. It's about winning souls for Christ. It is about getting others to come to the kingdom of God. Life is about God's kingdom. You will still have your business. You will still have money. You will do all those things you want to do. But primarily, your objective as a child of God is to win others for Christ. Let me hear an amen to that. Amen. It's about Christ. It is not about having more customers. It is not about looking good. It is good to look good, right? I like to look good. Do you believe that? <laughs> you believe I like to look good? Can you see my shoe? <laughs> oh my God. Try to put some little humor in this to make it flow better. Amen? Like I tell people, I say, life is too short to be too serious all the time. Just laugh. And I've met people who live long if you find out they laugh a lot, they're always happy and making others laugh. Don't be too serious. Don't be too sad. Just throw away sadness from your face. Smile all the time. You have fewer muscles to smile, eight muscles to smile, 32 to frown. Work on the smiling muscles and increase them and stop frowning your face like you are baptized with lemon juice. You are baptized with the Holy Ghost. So smile. Don't be all looking all mad and sad as if you want to kill somebody. My goodness, put a smile in your face. The Bible said, this is the day the Lord has made and I will and be glad in it. So be glad. I don't care if you have a flat tire. Be glad. I have a flat tire for some weeks now. I'm still glad. I have to go change that flat tire. I'll do that quick. But I'm still glad. You see, be glad. Whether you have a flat tire, be glad. Whether you can't pay your bill, be glad. If you are sad, that doesn't bring the money. Just be glad and rejoice. When you rejoice and be glad, the devil panics. The devil is confused. He's trying to make you sad, now you're happy. He, he takes away your job, you're still smiling. He takes away your livelihood, you're still smiling. You're not sad or depressed. What's wrong with this person? Every time I do something bad, he's happy. It's like the more I mess with him, the more he's happy. And I want him sad. Let me just leave him alone because he gets too happy when he loses something. That leaves you alone. Or where are we? What, what, what was I saying? Amen. So, follow Christ and I'll make you fishers of men. So now you can see our qualities of fishermen. And Jesus picked fishermen because they are qualities that, he, that they have. That he wants you and I to learn from. Number one, you cannot be a fisherman if you are not patient. And was a patience. So for you to reach the lost for Christ, you must be patient. I have never seen a fisherman that is not patient. If you see fishermen catching fish, you, you know they're patient because they throw the, is they call it bait? The line. And they are there just like this. Waiting. Right? They're waiting. 
for the fish to come. And so we stand there for a long time. And they will check to see if nothing happens. They'll just be there. So the fisherman is patient. So one quality you must have as a, a child of God who, has, who is following Christ, who wants to catch fish for Christ, who Christ is making into a fisherman, you must be patient. I was a patient. patient. Number two, you must persevere. You must persevere. You must not give up. Fishermen don't give up. They persevere. They go for what they really want. They go for the fish. Persevere. Number three, they have courage. I want to say courage. That's why the fishermen can be driving, not driving, can be canoeing a small boat, and they are in the big ocean. They have courage. They, they are, they are, their boat is so small in the middle of an ocean that is courage. So it takes courage to win people to Christ. Everyone say patient, perseverance, courage. Number four, they have to have an eye. An eye for what they're looking for. Let me explain what that means. They have to know what they're looking for. When I went fishing with my dad, we knew where the fish is. We have an eye. We know, you know what, if we set this trap by that little corner, we're most likely to catch a fish. There's an eye. Number one, Patience, number two. Perseverance, number three. Courage, number four. Having an eye for what you're looking for. Having an eye for this unbeliever who does not yet believe in Christ. Knowing who they are. Number what? Five? Number five. Number five. This one, I have to explain this to you. I understand being catching fish as, as a young man. So I went, I went fishing again, you know, some years ago with a friend of mine. Something you did when you catch fish is that you hide. You don't want the fish to see you. You together? Now if the fish sees you, what would they do? So you hide. That means that you disguise. I don't know what that means. That means that you don't just come wearing a big cross. Jesus loves you. Repent. <laughs> or you go to hell now. Uh, I have witnessed to people. I have been more effective with this to people. I have dealt with people for like weeks without knowing that I was even a pastor. So I'm just found out today. So I'm found out last week. See, but I have had influence in their life by dealing with them. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I said a bad word yesterday. I didn't know you were a pastor. That lady told me you were a pastor. That's okay. So I began to minister to her. But if I came as a pastor, the very first day they met me, guess what? They will start acting right and pretending to be that good. So I just showed up like one of them, like the fish. I may smell like them. I may look like them, but I am not them. When they cursing, I just keep quiet. Everyone say, keep quiet. keep quiet. I never stop cursing. That's wrong. You can't, why are you cursing like that? No, I just I say, my time is coming. I'm going to get an opportunity to tell them. But I cannot tell them now because I would mess up what I'm trying to do. If I must win them for Christ, I must gain their trust, I must gain their respect, they must know I'm with them, I'm on, the, I'm on their side, that I know what they're going through. And gradually, I can start telling them, you know what? Jesus loves you. I say, but why don't you get mad? I ask them, do you really want to know why? Yes, we're all upset here, but why are you not upset? I say, do you really want to know why? Yeah, because we, we want to be like that. We, you, are just, you just come here, you're so calm and so relaxed. Everything is chaotic and you just do as if nothing bothers you. Say, so, do you really want to know why I'm like that? Please tell us. Then that gave me a chance to talk to them about the God of heaven. 
So the reason I'm like this is because of Jesus in my life. And that same Jesus in my life can also be in your life if you would open your heart to him to come in. Now that gave me opportunity to witness and I did that today. I met a lady today who I have been talking to, meeting her for like weeks. Never there was a Christian. Had a chance to meet her alone. And from there she said, I can't believe you're a pastor. In fact, they told me you're a pastor yesterday. The lady said you're a pastor. How do you know? That lady Say the one that came for uh, that came to our program last Friday. I mean Friday healing service. See, she told us you're a pastor. I said, really? I said, yes. But you should have told us. Maybe if you tell us you're a pastor, maybe everybody would behave better in this place. I said, no, I'm a pastor. But so I said, you know what? I just gave her my card. This is the card. Wow, I don't know where, where is your church. I got to come check it out. Now she's coming. I said she's coming. So you don't just show yourself like that. If you want to win somebody, be dead in their shoes. Know where they hurt. Know, understand their situation. Come down. When I mean come down to their level, doesn't mean do what they do. Now, don't forget this. Jesus Christ had friends that were sinners. You know that? He ate with the sinners. He spent time. No, let me, let me rephrase that. Because spend time, people, people are very funny when they interpret stuff. He even talked to the prostitute. He talked with them. He, I guess I can say he spent time with them. You all know what I mean by that, right? Yes. He even spent time talking with a prostitute. And he warned them. Mary Magdalene, the very first evangelist, was a woman who was a hooker. And also, not just that, she was possessed with demons. She was, a, she was the first evangelist in this world. A woman was the first evangelist. She went and broadcast the news to the disciples, Jesus is risen. That's evangelism. Amen? So Jesus didn't mind. The Bible even said that Jesus Christ even dealt with the Republicans. I mean, he's not talking about Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> okay. The Republicans are the tax, were the tax collectors. And the tax collector was the worst profession to be dealing with. These are the crooks of those days. He, he dealt with them. He even ate in their homes. But he, he was on a mission. Once you know your mission, it doesn't matter who you associate with because you know where you're going. But you must give yourself a time for the mission to be accomplished. If you see yourself drawing into that, you better get yourself out of it. And let me qualify this by saying, you must also know your level in Christ before you deal with what you are coming out from. If you were a prostitute in the past, you have no business trying to win other prostitutes because they may drag you back into prostitution. If you were an alcoholic, you say, let me win alcoholic to Christ. So let me just go to the beer parlor, you know, and just, just drink a little bit, maybe by the, you get back to drinking. <laughs> Oh, let, me, let, let me go to the joint. Man, I've learned some words. You know that? <laughs> I can't believe this. Let me go to the joint. The jo <laughs> joint is where they smoke, right? Yeah. Let me go to the joint. Hang out in the joint, you know. Maybe if I just have a little puff of the blunt. Yeah, got it. <laughs> if I just have a little pipe, no, smoke. What do you call it? Puff. 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 Is it called it Puff? The blunt? Heat. Heat. <laughs> then they will come to Christ. No. You don't have to do that with them to win them to Christ. It is your difference that attracts them. It is difficult to win somebody to Christ if you are doing exactly what they're doing. It's hard. They will not listen to you. They will call you very quickly a hypocrite. And you'll be so ashamed of yourself. Look at that hypocrite telling me. Like, you hypocrite. So, you cannot do what they're doing and expect them to come to Christ. And I think that is a problem we have in this culture. Because in this culture, America, we have a lot of people who go to churches, but they're not the same like everybody else. Talk the same way. 
cross the same way, dress the same way, smoke the same way, drink the same way, eat the same way. We are the same. Why they for you? They will tell you, I'm happy where I am. But you don't show any difference in your life. You are you curse, I curse you. You fight, I fight. So why is it a big deal? We are the same. But it is when you are different that you become attractive. People are attracted to difference. Are you getting that? To make a difference, you have to be different. Let's say together, to make a difference. I have to be different. You got to get that in your spirit. Because you cannot make a difference if you are like everybody else. You have to be different. You have to be different. And if you want to be the focus of your generation, you have to learn to be focused on what you are doing. You can't do one thousand things. Do one thing and do it well. Let, the, let people know you for what you're doing and do it well. If, if you want to be a Christian, be the best Christian they know of in Allentown. Best Christian. Say, man, that brother, man, he is a true Christian. I don't know if you know, if you see a true Christian, you will know, you will know them. <laughs> we know those. We know Christians who are real Christians. I will know Christians who are not real we, we, we all know that. Say, look at that one. He's my church, but Mike, forget her. She is. That one there? Nah. That one, that brother there, if you give him any opportunity, man, he, he just don't trust him. Because they know those you cannot trust. So, but the, but the bottom line of today's study is that no matter where you are, Jesus calls you, not because you are so qualified, but because he has qualified, because he had called you, it would make you to be fishers of men. Now, this is the challenge. Every one of us have to go out and catch fish. How do we do this? How does this scripture come to pass in our life? But pastor, I don't know how to preach. You don't have to know how to preach. The best you can do to, to really help you out is just tell them, like Sister Brittany told Brother, uh, take off your name now. Just tell me the first letter. The first letter of your name. Huh? Q. Q. Oh my goodness, I still don't get it. Second letter. Quaram, Quasham. Wow. Second letter. Second letter. Yes. Quit him. Wow. Quit him. God bless you. Thanks so much for, for coming in with uh, Sister Brittany <laughs> for, for, for Bible studies today. God really bless you. Yeah. You can at least invite somebody to come to Bible studies so they can hear the gospel of Christ preached. That is a way of being a fish catcher. Amen? Talk to your neighbors. Invite them. Be involved in this work. Jesus Christ gave the great commission. What was the great commission? Go into all the world and do what? And preach the gospel or make disciples of all nations. Beginning from where? Beginning from Oh man, I know. We have to teach the Bible. Beginning from Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and up to the uttermost part of the world. Where is, where is your Jerusalem? Right where you are. Where is your Judea? Your neighbor. Where is your Samaria? Your place of work. Where is the uttermost part of the earth? Everybody else you see. But you got to start from where you are first. Preach to your uncle, your nephew. Talk to them about Christ. Talk to them about your church. But I must say this. This church is doing a great job in doing that because I meet people outside that tell me, oh yes, I've heard of the spirit, this church. Yes. 
People tell me, I was walking by and my leg bumped into a flyer. And I checked at a spirit temple. And I told myself, I'm going to check it out one day. Yes, I've met people that told me that too. So you guys are doing a great job. But we can certainly do more for God's kingdom. Going out there and bringing others to Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's review quickly the qualities of fishers. Men. Number one. Faith. Number two. Courage. Number three. Courage. Number four. Number five. What? Yes, don't be just low key. And that's why when, when, when the fisherman throws the fish, in the hook, there is a bait. The bait, they, they, they use worms. I know in America we use fake worms most times. They use real ones now. I know in Nigeria we actually go dig for the worm and then we get worms and we use the real life worm that really moves for real. So the, the, the worm covers the, the hook. So you cannot catch a fish if you show them the hook. You got to come nicely and really get them to be interested in what you have to say. You can't go with number one, you got to brush your mouth. You know that. But if, if your mouth is smelling, it turns off who you are witnessing to. That is a practical part of it. When, when, when we used to go out witnessing, the first thing we are told is brush your mouth. Number two, don't be too rich in God. Because it just turns them off. You chew it before you get there, throw it away, and then talk with them. No, Jesus loves you. He just loves you so much. To repent. <laughs> Done that, been there. So, because people to receive you, you have to really present yourself in a very respectable manner. Amen? Amen. Don't do what they do. As the grace of God to help you, and I believe he will help you. Amen? Let's give a clap to the Lord. <clears throat> Any questions? I know we have said a few things tonight. Are you blessed tonight? Did you learn something? Yes. Amen. Amen. It's exciting. Yes, you have a question? You've been, you've been doing a great job. You've brought a lot of people here. You've brought your friend, you've brought another friend, and brought another friend, and another friend, and another friend. Then, fisher, you've been fisher woman. <laughs> fisher woman. Yes, a any questions before we close? Yes, brother Haywood. Please, uh, let him give you the mic so that I can hear you in the front here. The word is sky. Style. Sky. 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 Oh, these guys. Yes. That... I got you. I got you. Why disguise? That, the, that word disguise, that's what I'm, I was selling initially trying to get the right word, but I give you what I mean by that. <clears throat> what I mean disguise <clears throat> basically means don't carry a big cross on your, on your forehead. Don't wear a big cross feel that like that is going to do the job. Disguise means come to them without showing them I'm a Christian. Without carrying the cross. And there are people that do that and they are torn off for the fish. They turn off for the fish. They really turn off because the fish sees them coming this way, they go this way. If a, a chronic, I was a chronic, if a chronic unbeliever that does not want to repent sees you coming with a big cross this way, he goes this way. Exactly. He avoids you because you, 
you are obvious. But if you come to them like you dress right now, you don't know that you, you are even a, a Christian. Then you say, how are you doing, sir? Fine. What is your plan tonight? I'm just going to have a cup of coffee. I'm tired of my job. Can I have coffee with you? Sure. I'm, come if you want to. You keep talking. Then, into a discussion, you may ask them, have you tried Jesus? You see, but now you've, you've started talking to them about other stuff first. It did not come right away. Say, you, know, you better believe in Jesus. He's the only way because if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to die in that trouble. I'm telling you. You, 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 you better be- That guy is going to just walk away from you because you, you have not, dis- I call it disguise, but it could be a better term for that. You are too obvious. You cannot catch a fish by showing them that you are a fisherman. They will run away. I'm just telling you the nuggets of how to get fish. You come to them like a fish. That's why Peter would be Paul. Paul would say, I am everything to every man so that by any chance I can win somebody to Christ. I'm everything to every man. I cannot, Apostle Paul would go to, the, to, to Greece and he would behave like he's a Roman. He would go to the Jew and he would do what the Jews do. If I go to a place that is not a church, I don't go there carry my Bible and distribute my business card. God, that immediately can turn off the unbeliever. This business card right away would attract other Christians. But I'm looking for the fish. So this business card doesn't come first to a fish. It comes last to a fish. What comes to a fish is my heart, my love, not my cross. Because the cross is foolishness to those who are not Christians. So you don't show the cross right away to an unbeliever because they will despise the cross. They hated Christ. They don't want to deal with Christ. So you come to them like, everyone say like, you are one of them. In that way, you can win some of them. Done many things already, even in this church, with a lot of people I do it here. Sometimes, ordinarily, I wouldn't do them, but to win them, I got to do some things I do. Not because I want to do that, but I have to do that. I've got out with some of you to have lunch and, so, and dinner. How many of you have lunch with so far? Exactly. You, you, didn't your, you better lift your hands up. You better do this. <laughs> Don't be hiding there. And you too. Now you dinner is dinner. I do that not because I can't eat at home, but because to develop relationship, to spend time. That is how you, you form a bond. So we do certain things not because it's, it's something you must do, but because it's something that you know when you do them, you can win others to Christ. Amen. So that's why I say disguise. But it's not like you are faking, but like you are not showing that you are coming to catch the fish. Did I make myself clear to you? Amen. Any other questions? Go ahead. (laughs) How many fish did you catch last week? How many fish did you eat last week? (laughs) All right. Brother Quentin, any question? No question. All right. Any question on this side? So you all understand about catching fish? I mean, a few would would agree with me. Pastor, you know what? I'm going to make my effort and trust in Jesus to help me to catch at least three fish. Or should I say fishes or fish? This week. I don't know if you can really make that commitment. Amen. 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 We all need to do that. We all need to go out and catch the fish. Amen. Don't wear a big cross. Just come like you are. Like Just come like this. That's fine. People relate with you more. If I dress up like a pastor, some people may get scared. They won't even want to talk to me because I, got, I can't even be myself. They will start pretending. Amen. All right.